Welcome to the BC Assembly of First Nations Youth Podcast. I'm BCAFN Youth Representative Taylor Bain Tacosa. And hi, my name is Justin Peters. I'm phoning in today. Uh, unfortunately, you won't be able to see my face, but you'll be able to hear my voice. And in future episodes or past episodes, you'll get to see both me and Taylor. Thank you for tuning in. As part of our five part series, we have launched this podcast to talk about pressing issues for First Nations youth in British Columbia, while hosting various emerging Indigenous leaders to talk about these issues. We will be releasing monthly broadcasts on a range of topics, which will be available via video podcast on our BC AFN Facebook group or via audio through our youth.bcfn.ca website. Today we have Megan Metz joining us to talk about mental health and the work she is doing in her community to revitalize her language. Welcome, Megan. Um, Megan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, yauts nuch Megan ti and a chabrach kaiu kek elens mozi ke hechinuen chaisla nuga. So hi, my name is Megan Metz. My chaisla name is Kandoch. I come from Tsimotsa, uh, currently known as Kitimat Village. I come from the Kilauea clan and the Heisla Nation. Um, I am 23 years old. I actually work for my nation right now in the culture and language program. I'm the digitization and preservation technician. So I do a lot of work with our archives, whether it's recordings, documents, audio visuals. I'm sort of constantly learning, but I think that's what I really enjoy about it. I really try to find ways to share what I've learned with the community. Through my job, I'm also fortunate to do a lot of language work with elders, fluent speakers, and I do various presentations and try to share the teachings and stories with our youth at our annual culture camp that we have. I'm very passionate about mental health advocacy and language revitalization, so I really enjoy opportunities where I get to bring both of those worlds together. It's nice to meet you guys. Thanks for having me on today. Nice to see you again, Taylor. <laughs> yes, it is so good to see you, Meg. Um, yeah, we've known each other for quite a few years now, and I'm always inspired about the work you're doing with your community and just how passionate you are about everything that you do. And I think it really shows. So yeah, it's great to have you. Um, as a mental health advocate, you have shared your story through channels like We Matter, and you even took part in First Nations Health Authority's youth COVID-19 campaign last year. How did you come to be on this journey of advocating for issues that you care about? Yeah, so um, this work is something I feel that I've sort of grown into a little slowly over time as I slowly gained momentum and got more comfortable and confident in myself, my knowledge and my abilities. Um, I first started by applying to all the different like conferences, trainings and like projects that were of interest to me that were targeted for youth. The first one I ever attended being the Youth Ambassadors Program in 2015. Uh, since then, I've attended, presented, and spoken on, you know, different panels at events from the community level right up to the international level. Um, I will say at the beginning of this learning journey, I was very confused. I definitely did not have it all figured out from the get-go, but I knew in my heart I wanted to be a part of something bigger than just me. I looked around at my community like society as a whole, and I knew there needed to be change, and I wanted to try to set myself up to be a part of that change. I think that's why I started wanting to attend all these different trainings, just to find what my passion was, because I wanted to let that fuel me. Um, I wanted to strengthen my leadership skills, find hope, find inspiration to just keep moving forward, and I specifically tried to seek out opportunities that could bring me outside of my reserve to help me go and experience the world and meet and learn from people that have different lived experiences that come from different walks of life. What were they doing in their communities? How are they doing it? Where did they get started and who supports them now? How can I do that in my own way for my people? And I think attending these types of events I got to build some pretty incredible connections with youth doing uh, remarkable things in their community. And that alone made me feel like my dreams and my visions were a lot more possible. I realized I needed to create my own sort of team here at home that could not only support me, but guide me through all of this to ensure I can accomplish these goals. 
Um, when I reached out to people and asked if they'd be willing to mentor me, I got an overwhelming response of yes, which I was so grateful for. I feel like we're definitely at a pretty pivotal time where people are a lot more comfortable and willing to share these types of teachings with our youth again. And I just wanted to hop right in the middle of it and just like absorb as much knowledge as I can that people were willing to share with me. I wanted to understand things better, you know, in general life more specifically, you know, myself, my family. And as I built this network of youth and mentors for myself, um, I was eventually invited to apply to different groups or committees. And one of them was life promotion for all my relations. It's kind of a youth advisory committee made up of indigenous youth. I applied right before the deadline, really hoping I'd be accepted and I'm so grateful I did. That was another really huge step in myself and getting into this advocacy work. That's how I was introduced to um, initiatives like We Matter. So that was kind of my first step into really publicly trying to tell my story and connect with people on that level. But um, yeah, it's really where I guess I honed in on my, my training and my skill set as it relates to the mental health work that I do. So yeah, really just trying to attend as much training and stuff as I could until I found what worked for me. And then once I did, I just worked on honing in on those skills. That's really interesting, Megan. I have a somewhat similar story of uh, going to these youth conferences and finding things that interested me. For me, it was learning about governance, economic development, entrepreneurship, and uh, just basically learning as much as I can. And the biggest part was connecting with other youth having a chance to share my voice, and more importantly, probably the most important thing, listening to others, uh, whether it be elders, presenters, other youth, or just the information that different organizations or uh, different uh, leadership councils or um, whoever had anything to share is um, helped me a lot to uh, find my direction and uh, mark my path. But uh, you mentioned your part your, your uh, participation with the life promotion for all my relations youth advisory committee through the First Nations Health Authority. Could you tell us about the work that the life promotion advisory has done and your role on that committee? And I just want to throw some. I know that's a lot, but uh, I just want to throw something else to ponder. If there is anything you've learned through this role that you think other youth and communities could. Uh, you in their own communities. Makes sense. Okay. If I forget to answer the second half of that, remind me, I'll circle back. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah. Life promotion for all my relations is a mental health advisory group. It's made up of indigenous youth from the five health regions of First Nations Health Authority. So I myself help represent the Northern Health Region alongside my good friend Taylor here. Um, this committee was brought forth, as you mentioned, by First Nations Health Authority, but also Fraser Health. And I believe there was support and funding from the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Um, we, um, we've actually done a lot of different things as a committee, both individually and collectively, again, at all of these different levels. We've had our personal projects, which aligned with our individual passions and just strive to make and see change in our own communities. In advisory capacity, reviewing works from nonprofits in British Columbia. We've hosted online events uh, with FNHA. Um, we've shared our personal stories on social media through, as we mentioned, that COVID-19 campaign with First Nations Health Authority. Um, I believe that's still up on their website too. If you feel like checking out our stories and our videos, it's fnha.ca slash youth. Figured I'd mention that here quickly while we're on topic. But more personally, I think being a part of this committee helped my confidence in public speaking. Uh, I gained a lot of mental health and wellness skills training and our group was provided many opportunities to not only gather, but like truly bond and have these different cultural experiences together. Um, of course, with COVID, we haven't been able to gather as much as we normally would, but our work continues. As we mentioned, we had that COVID campaign where we all 
share different ways we've individually been staying well throughout the pandemic, whether it's through culture, skill building, or getting fit, just to name a few. Um, last year, we also had the opportunity to virtually present our work at the World Indigenous Suicide Prevention Conference. So although we may be working from home, we can't gather in person like we normally would, we're still pushing forward. Um, this committee, as we mentioned, is actually where I met Taylor and that's where our friendship and our connection began. And I think it's, I almost wanna say surreal to see how far we've come since then. It does not feel like that much time has passed, but at the same time, I feel like time is flying and I cannot stop it. <laughs> it's been just quite the journey to become the people we are today and continue this work that we've done. Um, and yeah, I just, oh, sorry. The other part of the question was, what do I think I've learned that others may benefit from? Was that, just wanna clarify. Okay. Um, no, I, would, I just kind of threw that in there. Um, if there were things that you'd learn from your experience uh, that other youth could uh, learn from themselves. But you know what? Even with your answer, with what you've already said, it you sort of already did it. So we can uh, move on to Taylor's next question. Okay, sounds good. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it is really surreal. But I think it's has been, I think this is four years since we started, maybe five. It's like, it's such a blur because it's like, we've done so much in the time we've been together. And with that advisory committee and I think just even your um your answers before that just talking about that connection to to other youth has been I think the most valuable and just that like cross-cultural learning and yeah um I think just the people that um are listening to this podcast I know will I I I mean I feel inspired just listening to you and so um, yeah, again, just applauding you for all the work you have done and the work you'll, I know you'll continue to do into the future. I think I'm um, still kind of staying on this topic of mental health. Um, what is something you wish people knew about mental health? Yeah, actually really, uh, this question almost scared me a little bit at first because I was like, oh no, I don't know. But then I really thought about it and I was like, well, actually there's a lot of things I wish people knew. Um, I wish people knew that caring for your mental health goes beyond the scope of what most assume up front. Um, I guess I'm trying to say I wish people thought of mental health in its more holistic sense. It's not just the things that you think about. It's, it's kind of everything because everything is connected from the media that you consume to the foods that you eat to the people that you surround yourself with and the hobbies that you use to pass time it all impacts you in some way. And speaking more from a Heisel perspective, um, we speak of grounding ourselves in the power of the earth because we believe we get our strength as humans from the earth. And when we say this power from the earth, it's actually our connection to the land. And it's actually the power of our mind too because we believe the mind is the backbone of our medicine. And we have specific ceremonies we do to strengthen this connection to ourselves, to the land, to our spirit. Um, when we braid our hair, for us Heisel people, the three strands represent the body, mind, and the spirit. And when they're woven together, they become strong and impossible to break. So you see, these things are all supposed to be working together in ways that complement each other. And that's what makes us stronger. When you find yourself overcompensating for one thing, you may actually be neglecting yourself and others without realizing it. So we need to practice taking care of our entire being. As Indigenous people, I feel like part of us understands this inherently. It's just a matter of reconnecting to and remembering that. We have our ceremonies and our ways of cleansing ourselves when we need to gain strength, when we're looking for wisdom. And I believe that returning to those teachings and returning to the land Will help bring that deep sense of healing we need on all of those levels. Beautiful. That's a really great way to put it. Um, switching gears here a little bit, you recently completed a First Nations language certificate at the uh, University of Northern British Columbia in the Heisla language. 
Can you tell us more about that experience? And was I, did I say it right? I think it's. Yeah. Yeah. Say. Heisla. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This has actually uh, been a really exciting program to be a part of. There are about 11 of us from the Heisla Nation taking this program. Some are from our village, others tune in from down south in the Vancouver area. But we even have one Heisla all the way across the country in Nova Scotia attending our classes to learn her culture and language. So it's, it's inspiring on a lot of fronts. We're currently learning the ropes of our new hybrid orthography. It's like our most recent writing system in our community. It's our first time really trying to standardize our writing system. Um, we've always been oral people or we, uh, you know, we're artists. We never really wrote down our language. So this is like, it's new for all of us. <laughs> and it's, it's been an interesting time for sure. Um, but getting this opportunity to learn my culture and language in ways, you know, my parents, my grandparents weren't able to, I'm very grateful. Um, but that's not to say it hasn't been quite the learning curve. Um, Heisla is not an easy language to learn by any means, but the support of my family, of my community and my people, seeing the way elders light up when they hear us speaking our language, like on social media or in the community, it really helps keep me going on days I'm consumed by like grief or heartache by just the ongoings of the world right now. They really help me remember the bigger picture. Um, pursuing this work can definitely bring up a lot of your own traumas in ways you're, you may not have expected. But the fact that I can confidently speak today without fear of making a mistake or being corrected or anyone laughing, I know I've grown. And I know that my growth, it ripples into um, my family. When I have less shame speaking, I find myself more eager to just like teach what I've learned. So it's been really healing for me. I'll like right after class, I'll run and I'll go share what I've learned with my family. When my nephew comes over, I'll speak our language to him. When I go visit my mama'o, my grandmother, I'll ask her if I'm saying things right. And I've realized now there's nothing in life that makes me happier than her smiling and saying like I understand what you're saying and she can reply back to me and it it's hard not to get emotional talking about that because that's that's healing and it's really beautiful I'm although it wasn't easy to start I'm, I'm grateful to be on this path and I just want to try make it more accessible so more of our people can have this kind of experience I'm literally trying not to cry myself. I'm like, oh, I miss my grandparents so much. And they were the only fluent speakers in, on my mom's side. And what a gift, like, oh, and what a cool program. I'm like, I wish they had a Dene language class that I could just immerse myself in and learn from. So that's super cool. And also I think the one good thing about COVID, I guess the one, something good that came out of it is like this realization that like Zoom and like online technology is actually useful and like having knowing that you have like a Heisla member out in Nova Scotia that's learning like amazing amazing I'm like oh just I'm yeah just so impressed by your nation um like yeah hats off to you guys that's so cool um as you know I'm sure that um the UN has declared 2022 to 2032 the decade of Indigenous languages which is like just I'm really excited to see like what comes out of that and like how other communities can learn from communities like yours Megan that are like doing this work and that are really providing opportunity for their members to learn I think that's like for me personally it's like I just don't have the opportunity and so I think finding ways to create those are is really important um so I'm wondering um how from your from your perspective and experience how can other youth get involved in language revitalization in their communities and do you have any tips or resources you can share yeah absolutely um I will of course mention uh First Peoples Cultural Council they have grants for mentor and apprentice programs so if you know a fluent speaker in your community it can be a family member um, you would apply together and there is uh, some funds you'd be able to get to help you have a certain amount of hours practicing your language. There's also First Nations Education Foundation. They help um, communities with digitization work, building resources, 
and they're really all about supporting communities in such a way that it'll be sustainable for them, even if FNEF, First Nations Education Foundation, is no longer involved. We've personally, our nation works with Scott Jiri, and he, I can't say enough good things about him. He just goes above and beyond for us. He um, also helps you with searching for funding too, if you're also not sure where to go, he's very helpful. Um, he, um, him and his team of linguists from Trinity Western, they actually brought the rapid word collection, uh, I guess, methodology here. And it was one of the first times this um, method of language collection had been used. I don't know if it was in all of Canada or just in BC, but it was a really incredible experience. We've gone through that collection process twice now, once for words and once for stories. And it is amazing to see all of your elders and speakers in one room together, just speaking the language, laughing, eating traditional food, sharing their memories of what you know their childhood was like. It was so beautiful and so healing on so many levels. So I definitely encourage y'all to um, utilize those resources. I'll also just say, if you have language champions in your community already doing the work, approach them and ask if they'd be willing to mentor you. I know that sounds really scary, but because I thought that was scary too, but that's also a first step I took to do this kind of work in my community. And you'd be surprised um, how shocked people will be that you approach them with such a simple question and they'll be so excited to share with you what they've learned. Job shadow them for a while or apply to be a summer student in their program. Begin networking as soon as you possibly can and you can start by building connections in your own community first. Once you get your name out there and people realize you're serious about what you're doing and you're seeking this guidance to ensure you do things respectfully, they'll be so happy to guide you. As I mentioned, we're reaching a very pivotal time right now. So now's the time to, to try and, and catch people while they're, they're willing and they're comfortable to share this truth with us. Because the truth is coming out and, and we're, not, we're not afraid anymore. So I guess my advice would really be reach out because people might really surprise you. My current mentors were not in my life in any capacity before this work, but I seen the work that they did in our community. I admired what they were doing. I realized I wanted to do similar work in my life. I made an appointment with them. I asked to be their mentor one day and the rest is history. So um, sometimes that first step is really uncomfortable, but the first step gets you started. You, whatever direction you decide to take, you'll find your way. Wow, Megan, that's really inspirational and uh, really good advice. You have a lot of wisdom to share, and I'm really glad you uh, you got to share that. That was really moving, to, to be frank. That was really awesome. Um, I guess for our last question, uh, what is next for you in 2022? Are there any other issues that are important to you that you want uh, to get involved with? Ooh, what's next for me? That is a very good question. Sometimes I still wonder that. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely, I feel myself getting really passionate about the idea of rediscovery coming back to our culture camps. Just because, as I mentioned, it's an opportunity for me to bring together my mental health discussions with land-based healing and just reconnecting to land, language, and culture. Um, I'm also becoming very passionate about um, receiving more recognition and reclamation on traditional place names. Considering it is now the decade of Indigenous languages, I feel like now's the time to do that work. Um, also, and with honoring Indigenous rights and title, the, these cultures and these languages that existed in these areas well before um, society as we know it today existed. And I feel like that also goes hand in hand with rebuilding these nation to nation connections that we once had, not only with our coastal people, but I feel like it would be incredible to see what we as Indigenous people could do worldwide if we found ways to connect more and learn from each other more. So I know that's a lot, it's maybe not just 2022 plans, but um, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling a lot more inspired lately to just keep moving. And that's kind of some things that have come onto my radar as of lately. Well, we are so excited to continue to follow your journey um, and 
to hopefully hopefully we can have you back on again um in the future and you can tell us more about it because you you're going places and it's just such an honor that um to have you here with us today i know you you were talking a lot about he healing kept coming up in your conversations about um when you're talking about language revitalization and i um it's i think it's really cool to think about the overlap between like mental health and health in general and languages so I think that was like my wheels are turning on that is like well, that's really an interesting concept to think about um and so yeah again just thank you so much for being on our podcast today Megan uh it's so great to connect again I'm sure our paths will continue to cross um I'm always inspired by your journey and the work you do for your nation and for Indigenous youth across the province, the country, and of course, in your community. Um, yeah, Masi yeah and to echo what Taylor said, you know, I think we'll hear more about you in the future, Megan. It seems like you're really shaking things up and doing a lot for your, uh, your nation. I <laughs> would love to have you back in the future. And uh, yeah, so yeah, it was really inspiring to learn about the work that you're doing in your community and beyond. So uh, thank you so much for stopping by today, Megan. If people want to get in touch with you or follow along your journey, where can they find you? Um, I'm usually on most social media by my Chaisla name. Um, it's Q-E-N-D-A-U-X-W. Um, I'm on Instagram. And I'm actually on TikTok. I share, I'm trying to start sharing more language stuff there too. So if you're interested in just hearing more high slow be spoken, check me out there. Awesome. Will do. I will follow you right after this. I'm like so excited. That's yeah, TikTok has become such a platform for sharing language. And uh, I'm glad you're like utilizing it. <laughs> um, but yeah, Messi Cho. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a wrap for our third podcast. Stay tuned on our BCFN Youth Facebook group to find out um, who our next guest will be. Masi Cho, thank you for joining us today. I'm Taylor Bain Tacoza. And I'm Justin Peters, and you're listening to the BC Assembly of First Nations Youth Podcast.